you can have a hierarchy. There's no sort of conflict between cooperative values and hierarchy. Um, you can have participatory management, right, where, yeah, we're going to all sit in a room and have a conversation. At the end of the day, one person is going to make that final decision. But it's still like a much more humane workplace. It's not as if there's like um, a deeply unpleasant workplace that's like top down consistently. But you can have that. There is a middle ground, and I think the middle ground especially falls around. When you might want to engage that middle ground is especially around um, being unwilling to fire people or not wanting to like, have that responsibility. Um, and so that's that's talks a little bit about organizations that have done. I'm going quite quickly through all these, but we can delve more deeply into them sort of in the conversation piece. Um, but it's really, if you want a more a workplace that's more conversational and participatory, that can happen in a not-for-profit. Clearly, it can also happen in a, in a work around cooperative, but the, it, is not, um, not this, it is not inherent, right? There are work around cooperatives that are quite large, thousands of people, hundreds of people, have very traditional management structures. You would look at them and you say, oh, there's the executive director, there is the like middle, there's the management, there's the middle management, and there's like the guys working in the there's the guys working in the warehouse. The different thing is that the guys working in the warehouse want to share, vote a share, can elect a board, that board can hire them, fire the manager. Um, it can be quite a long sort of road loop of accountability, and so it can often there's um, you go to push for unionization in a very large worker cooperative because you want to shorten that accountability uh, loop between you and your manager, between the sort of shareholder and the manager. Um, some, some worker cooperatives use unions, others use sort of a worker-owned, uh, like a, just an employee advocacy committee, for lack of a better term. And then, sort of finally, the, the real reason to look at a worker cooperative structure if you're in the folk arts nonprofit um, space and you would like to have the ability to both share risk and share reward and share financial reward much more broadly. That's really the employee ownership route. Um, if you feel as though you can make money, that it seems like an odd thing perhaps to say you want to make a bunch of money in the, in the uh, folk arts world. <laughs> but I, I think it's a real, there's like some level of possibility there, especially around space and control of space. I certainly would love to see a folk arts a for-profit that was also supportive uh, of contracting specifically. If you know, <laughs> anybody who wants to start a uh, wants to start a, a for-profit dance hall, you should let us know. <laughs> Especially space is one area where you could make you know a certain amount of money in the New York City scene. Um, and so that's so it's a question of like how you engage with democracy. Democracy is a question of who do you want to be accountable to. And is it about accountability? Is it about democratizing accountability? Is it about building a more participatory workplace? How far do you want to take that? And then do you or or are you actually trying to democratize and spread that wealth and risk and reward? Um, so a brief framework with some examples, and I would uh, invite people to give to ask questions about like, oh, I, this this is the thing we want to improve. This is the thing we want to change, um, and we can go much deeper into details from there. Uh, my name is Maida Rosenstein, and um, I'm the president of uh, Local 2110 of the UAW. It's a United Auto Workers local union. But I think the reason why I've been invited here is because we actually don't represent any auto workers uh, at all, um, but do represent uh, quite a few workers in cultural institutions, the largest of which is the Museum of Modern Art and the smallest, uh, the Bronx Museum of the Arts. Um, and we also represent uh, a number of workers in smaller nonprofits, not necessarily more in publishing than in, than in the arts um, directly. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about unionizing in those settings. Um, and I think it was interesting listening to the other panelists um, who I'm meeting for the first time here uh, today. And there's really nothing that anybody has said that I think would directly conflict or preclude unionization um, alongside these other approaches. But um, the fact is that um, 
in uh, you know in the world of uh, um, uh, cultural institutions and nonprofits in New York, um, what the reality is there are many work very few workers have unions. You know, uh, it's a, a, amazing how few of the cultural institutions are actually organized, even those that are in the public sector. And when you move off the, um, uh, you know, into either smaller institutions or, uh, you know, more rarefied uh, institutions like galleries and so on, uh, unions are virtually non-existent. And most workers who are working in those settings uh, ha have very little power in those settings. I mean, the option of actually, you know, uh, within their workplaces of actually deciding that they want to run their workplace differently or ask for a change in their board structure or elect anybody to the board doesn't actually exist because most people are working for a boss. Um, and uh, they don't have any uh, ability to uh, make changes in the workplace other than as individuals hoping to negotiate or navigate uh, a, you know, a better situation. Um, and, you know, and I would posit that really the, the step that people should be taking is, is looking at unions. Now, I, I understand there are obviously organizations in the arts um, and probably folklore is often that case, that are very, very tiny. And, uh, you know, people who are working in those settings are not looking to uh, or expecting to obtain uh, great wealth. Um, and, uh, you know, um, you know and, and, the, and the settings are, are smaller. But even in many smaller nonprofits, um, you know, there are inequities. And if uh, workers want to obtain, have the power to make change in their workplace, unionization is the way uh, to go. Um, whether, and unionization can address, you know, both the uh, most obvious uh, uh, inequities, you know, whether or not, uh, um, you know, the money is being spent, you know, the people who, who ought to be paid, uh, who are doing the work are getting the money, or, you know, an individual executive director is making, you know, a huge salary, and all the workers that make very little. That happens a lot in the nonprofit world. Um, uh, or, um, you know, two uh, things that are actually more broadly, um, you know, uh, uh, broadly wanting to change the way a workplace works. And uh, we've had numerous instances where people wanted to organize a union because they really were not motivated by money, um, but because they wanted to change the way the workplace was. And they didn't like the, um, not just the culture of the workplace, but they didn't like the fact that the workplace wasn't living up to its mission. You know, people, took a job in order to work in a certain kind of workplace and found that there were all kinds of uh, contradictions within that workplace and they wanted to address that. And I would also say unionization, if, if we had, you know, <laughs> just in addressing the theme of unionization and democracy, we are losing our democracy in this country in part because we are losing our unions, period. I mean, they, um, as less and less workers have any power and voice in the workplace, um, you know, not only are workplaces becoming less democratic, and you see that uh, in the extraordinary wealth inequality that exists, and even in nonprofits, Probably not in a folklore center, but if you look at the Museum of Modern Art or uh, a university, and you see how it's extraordinary that presidents of universities are earning multi-million dollar salaries. Extraordinary. Um, you know, true at the uh, Museum of Modern Art, too. These are supposedly institutions of our 
culture that are stand for education and for art and enlightenment, and yet you see incredible wage inequality. Um, and also, as workers and unions lose power in this country, it's affecting our democracy in in uh, in major ways. Uh, you know, in terms of our political power. And I think artists and people in the arts need to be on the same side as labor in these issues because we in unions probably are the last organized force in the country that are fighting the multitude of austerity measures that we're facing all across the country, in every city, in every state. Um, and who loses in these austerity measures alongside workers and poor people, but the arts, you know, which are often considered totally um, disposable. So uh, it seems to me there's a tremendous uh, stake that, you know, people in the arts, people who are concerned about the arts and about culture uh, should have with people who are concerned about workers' rights and unions, and there's a natural um, marriage that should that should happen here. Okay. Uh, one, I just, uh, for the sake of, um, in, in part, just reiterating a point among the three folklorists up here, which if I'm not reiterating, if I'm iterating, um, for, for me, very much, the issue of thinking about um, the changes we're trying to make that, that BFC, our acronym, it, the heart of it is values, right? And this is something that we, the three of us have talked about. Um, that if if um, what our work is grounded in the notion of uh, collaboration with communities, partnership, uh, not quite about giving voice, right? But about working with people so they can arrive at what they want to do. Um, and doing what they do with them, um, you know, that our internal structure should mirror that. And it, it became an increasing conceptual disconnect for me to think in terms of the points that you've made. You know, why is the executive director paid disproportionately to the rest of the staff if the point of this organization is focused on issues of collaboration, on cultural equity, and all these things. Um, and, you know, why do we have a top-down structure if what we're advocating for is something very different in the world? And, I mean, I don't think that, I mean, that, so that was really at the core, like, sort of, to, for me to reiterate for myself, I mean, you both made these points, but it's more for me to get thinking that that was, like, and, and I'll go further, uh, if I may, but, you know, the point here is that, you know, we had a meeting and we structured a document we called the Manifesto, right? And, my, sense, my feeling is this, that um, ethically, perhaps morally, you know, we have an obligation to think about how we structure the organizations we run to do the work we do in the world. What the folk, what Vermont Folk Life Center is experimenting with is a way to maybe have that kind of happen. You know? And what PFP is doing, in my mind, is something pretty similar. So like, I view this as kind of like an imperative and, but my, my own sort of reservations are, I don't know if it can work, um, for all sorts of reasons. But I just wanted to wrap up that component by making that point. But like, to me, this is like, it, 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 it's a fish shaking thing, you know? It, I mean, and, and like, you know, Selena and I had these conversations where it was like, I, I kind of don't like it, the fact that people can earn a lot more than other people at the same place. I want to say something yeah. about that too because um, it almost uh, the question is also though not just having an internal structure that reflects your values. I, I mean, I work for a union. I'm, I've been an employee and now I'm a boss. I'm the president of the union, so I'm really aware of all these internal tensions where you want your organization to reflect what you believe in, and you feel very sensitive all the time about every little thing, or, or, or my work is going to think I'm a boss just like the evil bosses that we're fighting. Um, but we also have to figure out a way to turn outward, not just inward, because, uh, I mean, I, I don't know, I sort of assume people here share the values and 
see that our country is in crisis and that um, you know we need to figure out a way to change it and that means finding ways to move these values Outward. And I recognize, you know, you guys are directors of cultural institutions. You're not necessarily, you know, have a, a directly political mission, although I believe the work that you do enhances, you know, our politics. But um, the advantage of unionization, it seems to me, and it, it's not in conflict with anything you say, is that it moves outward. You know, because we are trying to organize workers, and then those workers have more power to make other to make other changes. In addition to making their workplace fair. Oh, Miss Plumman, I mean, the, the thing I just wanted to say was that, like, the three people on the stage represent folks in different ways who are approaching these ideas from within the because I, I, I'm, I'm, there are many familiar faces here, and I assume that a majority of the people here have some connection to folk art's work. In, in the area, is that is that fair to say? You know, so that what you know what I have to offer is to say, as as a folklorist who's engaged in an organization, this is what we're thinking about, and you, what you guys present are different frameworks for thinking about the kinds of stuff we're thinking about. You know? Right. I was just gonna say, I think what's, what's really interesting here is that we're sort of bumping up against, and I, I wonder to what extent the, your organizations are bumping up against the the reality that. Many worker-owned cooperatives pop up against is that you want to be the absolute politically best you can be and live up to your values just as much as you possibly can. But you're also dealing, like, really realistically, for worker cooperatives in a market, both for uh, in a marketplace, right, which means you have to be like, really accountable to your customers and you can only really charge like, as much, you know, X amount. Um, and it's. And in the folk arts community, in the nonprofit community, you also run into you're not so much in the marketplace of uh, providing products to the extent, but you are in the marketplace for talent. Uh, and so I wonder to what extent. And so it's there's a, a real confinement, right? If you want to hire really good people, you know you it's, you might have to pay them a different uh, rate than hiring someone at you know than hiring someone just out of college. And if you want both of those types of people in your in your not in your nonprofit in your organization, you may have to like find a way to wrestle with in the short term with those challenges of like that violates our values, um, and so I think that's one one thing that argues a for a certain amount of realism in the sort of accounting. I hate to I'm constantly the most conservative cooperative person around this. Like no, you can only you can only go so every other the, the cooperative model says basically to me says. Every other business is here in terms of how they treat their workers. Like we can be here, but if you're here, you're going to go out of business. Um, and that's why I think it really argues for what unions do, in which there's a number of different ways of doing it, is intervening in long term. And that so that's folk arts organizations, especially interested in building democracy in the economy, um, intervening in the medium and long term in the mark in the sort of broader political and economic context. And that might mean um, in the long term, like we're, you know, it's fight for 15, so like the whole market, can, the whole market, labor market gets shifted up. It's also, maybe in Philly or in Vermont where the real estate market is a little lower, maybe you buy a house and offer housing along, like yes, everyone gets paid the same, but everyone gets housing, and therefore your lower aggregate salaries are in fact, um, your lower aggregate salaries are in fact not so low because you've sort of acquired long term economic power through the cooperative housing market, which actually exists. You could do that in both Philly and Vermont because they have quite strong uh, cooperative housing associations uh, and quite depressed real estate markets sometimes. Um, and anyway, so that's my uh, sort of my thought on sort of short term versus long term. You really have to work in all of those frameworks in terms of making democracy in the workplace more viable by changing the market. Another response to that, um, Maida, is that I think that the three of us and the others that were involved in some of this um, this thinking is we were finding ourselves um, working in a field where the work felt really powerful, um, and and we witnessed and were part of great impacts um, in terms of 
uh, the communities and um, right. our skills at listening and responding and supporting. In the case of my organization, we are a social justice organization. It's part of our mission. Um, and, and I think all of us were noticing that a lot of the structures in which, that we were working within did not, um, and I think field five, um, appropriately um, mimic the great work that people were doing outside of our house, right? right? And so um, the statement that Andy uh, eloquently <coughs> quoted from our manifesto um, about feeling like the structures of organizations need to mirror the values that we're putting out in the world is a challenge to us as folklorists to really um, think about you know, being who we say we are. So I think it's like a particular case to our discipline. Um, but I agree with you. Completely also. get it. Because, you know, we're a social justice organization, we're in unions, and, you know, we're supposed to be what we say we're advocating for. Right, and I was just going to add one of the points that has always bothered me in this conversation, something I think about a lot, is um, in some ways the privilege inherent in some of the work of this field, um, because many people take jobs that don't pay adequately, that don't have health care, that are piecemealing things together that take some certain privilege, which I think restricts um, who is in our field and who's, who's doing the work. Um, and I think that, that also it belongs in this conversation to like say that out loud, like what are we doing to think about um, adequately funding this work uh, so that we can um, make sure that we have more, I mean, this is also about inclusivity, um, about who's doing the work. So, uh, I think Eileen had a great structure plan for the evening, and I know we could keep going, but... Yeah, well, I'm just so excited that there's such an obvious synergy between your points of view. Um, we had talked about taking a quick break, uh, grazing on a bit of food back here, and then just reconvening, same formation, and um, we have a, a wireless mic. We thought we would just do question and answer and, and start getting a sense of what people's questions and reactions might be. And then through that process, move towards what do we do? What would people like to do? And where do we go from here? Do we have another event? That kind of thing. So if people are ready to take a, a food grazing break, I guess we're ready for you. Okay. Thank you.